I didn't really look at the questions. No, that's okay. But I mean, uh, we'll just we'll, we'll just wing it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been on uh, Tom's podcast as well, right? Tom Billu. Tom Billu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was at his place two weeks ago, actually. And same yeah. with Lewis House. Nice. It's a similar format, not as intense as Tom because he gets like like right into it. Yeah, yeah. And but he had like a he had like a live show. It was like it felt like it. a TV it was show. Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he goes all out. For he sure. goes all out. Yeah, he, he's amazing. And yeah. uh, it's more like Lewis, I think. It's more like conversational. Okay. Um, cool kind of that format but we can wing it as we go and if you ever want to like edit stuff out post-production we can always do that as well cool. so Sounds there's good. no pressure all right uh also we're going to challenge you to push up contests at the end as well okay i just did like 70 i right know I, and i heard i'm going to get him an ass kick too so this is going to be no, no, i'm not like that good plus like my i tore my rotator cuff on my left shoulder Ooh. and uh just got the mri Last week, and I have to get surgery pretty soon. So, so I can still do push ups. Yeah, I'm good. I just, I, I usually go floor to, floor to full extension, yeah. but I can't really do that because it, like, it hurts my shoulder. I can go like 60% down, I can't go all the way to the floor. Okay. I was thinking we just like the first one to 20 or first one to 25. We can go, we can go like, like as AMRAP, we can go as many as, as we can. Yeah. I just can't go to the floor. Okay. I can't do the full, like, you know, the deep push ups okay, okay. where chest hits the floor and then you full extension out. So we'll both, I guess, do kind of a half one and just go for Yeah, speed. yeah, yeah. I mean, I can only do like, like maybe 60%, like where the elbows are like maybe 110. You feel it when you go like that? 110 till I like feel like the, the, like the tear hurting a little bit more. Okay. But, yeah. What is, what is this for? It's my, my head. I'm sweating. What about me? You're good. Yeah, definitely. You have to tell me when I'm, I'm the sweaty guy. So oh, good. I got yeah. some powder here too. Let me, yeah, yeah. That. Let me know when I'm a. Uh, well, do you want to? Do you want to like quickly? Yeah, let me get a little powder. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to quickly talk about. You know, first of all, there's you are one of the few handful people that I think have gone through beyond their own community, whether it's EDM or even the Asian community, and you've been able to be received and loved by the global audience, which is so rare. I find in the Asian community. Definitely, absolutely. And particularly, you know, me being referred as Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee, there's right. only a handful, right, right, right. including yourself. So I wanted to start off by asking, why do you think there's only a handful of people compared to, let's say, some of the other races that are out there? That, I mean, that's the age old question. You know, I think everyone wants to know the answer to that. You know, especially, especially when you're in that group where you, you want to, you want to connect with people outside of just your community. Like for me, when I grew up, uh, Bruce Lee was was definitely my mentor, my hero. I talk about it all the time, yeah. um, uh, mainly because he was loved by the global community, mm. and and I I thought that was so cool that an Asian was loved. It wasn't like until later did I was I able to to analyze that. Um, because in, when I was a kid, I wasn't just like, oh, he's, he's loved by everyone. That's why I love him. I just more like, I knew he was cool and everyone liked him. And I like, that was the, the real reason why I loved him, you know, besides him being so cool. And, and, uh, I think now I'm 39, I'm still asking that question. Like, what is it? Why aren't there other Asians that, that are globally uh, recognized and have that influence like that can connect with so many people? Yeah. Cause like, that's my at my end goal here, um, I use music as a tool to connect with people. So essentially what I do and why I do it is to share and to connect. And music is my art form to, to be able to, my delivery system to be able to find that connection. Mm. And I'm, and I'm constantly, uh, the energy is constantly renewed. Whenever I connect with someone, I feel that authentic connection. I feel like that energy is like, um, powered up again. I'm like amplified again. Mm. So that's why I could be on the road for so, so much time. That's why I could be in the studio and work, work diligently on finishing all this music so that the end result is to connect, right? So, um, and, and I, I'm lucky because I get to see, I get to be part of that experience Live. at the end. Yeah, there, right? a lot of producers don't have that. You know, like a lot of producers just stay in the studio. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I get to be able to, to like start hitting the road and like going to all these different countries, all these different cultures and, and connecting. And, uh, yeah, it's, it is like a, such an incredible feeling when you go to, to these different countries and a lot of them don't speak 
you know, English. English. And a lot of them are not Asian. Hmm. And there's, they're chanting your name. They're yeah. chanting either Aoki or Aoki. You know, there is, well, depending on yeah, where they're exactly. from, yeah. but the fact is they're saying a Japanese name. They're saying an Asian identified name. And all of them are chanting that. So it's like there is that moment of self-reflection. I'm like, wow, there's people that are not Asian that are proudly chanting an Asian name. Mm. And especially here in America, that, that rings so strong too because, because the Asian uh, influential name, the Asian role model is not, no matter how, how hard we try, is not represented at the at the same level as some of these other you know some of these other uh, persons of color or other white people or other people that that you know have have that same kind of influence or whatnot. So it's whenever obviously whenever I hear or see another Asian that is that's treading a different route and doing something that's that's uh, breaking through, you know, it's it's like my obligation and also my responsibility as an Asian American to support them. Yeah. I think it's all of our responsibilities to really, to really, you know, build the community to help push other Asians up so that the whole tide of us can have, you know, a m much more influence in popular culture. Do you think that's what it was that there was a lack of people that have made it to a certain level that weren't really there to support or is it more the traditional education or the culture that we were taught not to speak out, not to express our own voice, and to be able to chart a different path than what most people are used to. You know, it's interesting that you say that because when I was in, uh, I took an Asian American class in uh, in uh, UCSB, um, or actually, I don't think I took one Asian American class. Huh. Um, when I really think about it, I, I was part of a group called Asian uh, Student Group. Okay. Can we stop? Okay. This is oh. going to happen a lot, by the way. Yeah. It's like so loud. Is it bad though, or is it like, let's just say yeah. this is how it's going Yeah, I don't mind stopping it. This, this is the problem with downtown. Downtown is like, because yeah. it's also, we're next to Skid Row, which is lots of activity and lots of like. Hey, Sean, you yeah. next to your phone. It's, uh, oh, is maybe, it? Maybe place your phone just a couple of feet away. Sure, I'll just get rid of my phone. Yeah. All right, cool. Oh, this is All good. I will, if it's too bad, I'll just raise my hand. You can choose to stop or not. Sure, yeah. Where do we, uh, where do you want us to start off? Just I'll, I'll start off where, where you got this question, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. I know exactly where to start. Okay. So when I went to UCSB, um, I had some influential Asian American um, professors and, and I was in a group called Asian. And, uh, and this woman, Diane Fugino, she wrote this book um, about an, a an, an Asian American activist and and he tells a story I'm not sure if she wrote the book but she was part of the book or, or definitely supporting this book and he tells a story of, of uh, being in the internment camps and how the Asian people in the internment camps they they were um, there was something about like the whole culture of Asian people in the internment camps that they did not resist they were obedient that there was no like protesting, there was no. It was like like if they're led this way, they're led this way. If they're led to death, they're led to death, mm. and they didn't fight that. They were very obedient, and uh, and then I didn't read this book, so I I don't want to bastardize the book, um, but he does talk about from what I got from the from like listening to her speak about the book, is that culturally, we're like the Asian community. I don't, I don't want to homogenize all of Asia right. as one community, but there's sectors of the Asian community that that uh, are are taught to be obedient, that taught not to, to like you know like stand out and and make a voice. Yeah, that we're you know that we 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 we're gonna go where we're supposed to go. And uh, when you think about that, then you think about the you know the outliers. It's hard to, to find an outlier in that. You know, of course, there's going to be people that aren't going to follow the rules. I mean, that's just human nature. But the culture itself, you know, it, it doesn't allow for one person to stand out, possibly. So that's that's one theory. You know, that's one theory that like it's harder to find the outliers when when uh, the culture itself is all about like you know that same that same kind of like non-resistance 
if so, you know? Yeah, I mean, for, especially for Japan and Korea, we lived, I mean, we're both kind of like Asian American, but there is a collectivism culture there where you want everybody to unite, and if somebody's off the path, or especially like when it gets to entrepreneurship, when you're in Japan or even in Korea and you fail, you are, you're not embraced, right? Versus the Silicon Valley culture where it's, or even just the American culture where it's very independent individualism. So I, I think you do make a good point about that. Well, like if you like if you go back to a civil rights struggle too, and yeah. the history of, of American civil rights, there was a large presence of the Afri African American population that really protested and made serious change for their people. Yeah. Same with uh, women's with the women's rights movement, and uh, and and the, the the kind of progress that, that that achieved as well. When you hear about the Asian American protest movement and that that voice it's very it's like marginalized yeah it's like or or it's either marginalized or it wasn't really that present you know it wasn't maybe that it wasn't even around really as much and i think that like goes to show the kind of culture like each culture how it's represented it's it's different yeah. and uh i mean there were i remember there's asian people when I was in college, I was really supportive of these Asian people, namely this dude named Richard Aoki. He was not my, he was not actually related to me, but he was last so name was Aoki. Yeah, but so you know. I didn't, I didn't meet him, but he was, he, uh, Richard Aoki and Yuri Kochiyama. Yuri Kochiyama was a Japanese American that, uh, that, that was fighting alongside and supportive of the Black Panther Party, and as well as, uh, I think namely more more namely Malcolm X. Wow. And when Malcolm X was was shot and murdered in the Audubon Ballroom, she was there holding his head. So she was next to Malcolm. Yeah, yeah. She was supportive of uh you know the African American struggle and the civil rights struggle through the African American voice. And I think for the Asian American people that stood out and actually made a voice in the civil rights movement, they they found more empowerment, I think, with with uh, with different ethnicities movements. Yeah, you know, and Richard Aoki is also um, known for supporting the Black Panther movement, and he was like one of the few Asians that like that were at the rallies. And there's pictures of him, like you know, the, like oh, like you know, the the, the Black Panther uh, rallying through the streets, you know, uh, you know, fighting for for their rights and and for their struggle. And, and then there's Richard Aoki with another guy. And actually, they formed a group called the Yellow Peril. <laughs> and that was, it was like two Asian guys, as far as I was concerned. Yeah, it was two Asian guys. And they were like, we're, we, we're down to, uh, you know, to represent for the Asian community um, to, you know, to embrace this change and this progress um, for, for equal rights. Mm. And, uh, and, and like, and I, I remember seeing that. So when I was in a band, I was in a band back then. Um, I, I'm digressing a bit, but I was in a band when I was in college, and it was called. We called it "This Machine Kills" from Woody Guthrie's "This Machine Kills Fascist," mm -hmm. which he had on this guitar. And uh, and then I called myself the Yellow Peril because okay. you know, kind of like paying tribute to uh, Richard Oak. He actually got to meet him in, in Oakland uh, before he passed away. And I actually got to meet Yuri Kochiyama as well at a, at a Free Mumia Abu Jamal rally in, up in the Bay Area as Did well. Did you ever so, part of that rally? Yeah, yeah, I, I was a, a, a big, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't say big, but I was definitely an activist mm. in, when I was in college and, and I was, um, I would travel around and, and uh, be part of the movement. But um, yeah, it was, um, it's, it's just interesting when you go into that world and you could even say that world has a lot of relationship and, and uh, understanding outside into the entrepreneurial world. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of relationship there because it's, we're all human, you know, whether we're um, creating business to, you know, once again, connect with people and, and share our technology, share the, the way in which we live our lives, which is essentially what, what, what I feel business for, and, uh, and to fight for change. When, you know, we're essentially doing the same thing in different realms, in different degrees and manners. But um, so it's like, what is it? Yeah, the question, we go back down to the question, like, why aren't there more Asians that, that have... That, that can surface globally and have that influence. Yeah, and I feel like it's a question that's rarely addressed and put in the spotlight. So I even yeah. talked to my mom just before this as well, and I was like, name three people that are as globally recognized that you can go to South America, Europe, Africa, and just be able to recognize that person. Yeah. And 
we were both sitting down and we're like, we had a tough time. But I think it's, you know, it, credit to you being able to put the spotlight in, being able to advocate for a lot of the few minority, you know, Asian Americans or just Asian people that are actually making this kind of movement. So right. that's, that's amazing. Um, and going back to your childhood, I know, and this is something that I really related to, which is being bullied and being discriminated against for being an ethnic minority, not just an Asian American, but you know, this is something that everyone can go through as well. And one thing that really stuck with me is the, I think it was in your documentary, one of the interviews where your mom had to apologize for something that you were a victim of. And when you asked her why you're apologizing, it's because she felt that she didn't want to feel isolated within the community. And obviously you've made a name for yourself out there, but as a kid right now that is in high school, in elementary, or even in college that's being discriminated against, or even in a young adult that feels like they have this limit, limited capacity because of the ethnicity that he was in. It doesn't matter whether it's Asian American or another ethnicity. What's your advice to them? Because you're one of the few people that have managed to break through and develop a love within the global setting. Yeah, you know, like going back to what my mom, like, so I, when I was, uh, I remember I got in a fight with this kid. It was my first fight. He was actually my, my really good friend no. at the time. Uh, no. And he was, uh, you know, he was, it was like, a torrent of name calling mainly racial slurs when i went over to his house and uh and i, and I was I, I was com i was completely confused because he's my friend i would always go over to his house and we'd like hang out and um and uh, i remember he was with this other kid that i didn't i knew i didn't i didn't know very well but i knew it was just a, a bad apple <laughs> you know just he was always like it's like a, a negative dude like that just was always like a kind of a hater and uh, and his name is clint this guy and uh and uh and i later found out like his, his um older brother was a, a nazi skinhead and he just didn't like anyone that wasn't white and so he definitely fed my friend a lot of baloney just to like not be my friend and yeah. say all this stuff and throw shit rocks at me and all kinds of stuff but um all that aside you know when i went and i confronted him and then we eventually got in a fight and i and i actually beat him up yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, re yeah. I really i really didn't understand what i was doing but like it's not like i was this tough kid that can fight back and yeah. it wasn't really that it was more like it was just a bunch of rage and i was just angry and i just yeah it wasn't really self-defense either i just was pushed into him and i started punching like, <laughs> okay. like blindly punching like yeah, and I, yeah. somehow the kid hit the floor and i just kept going and then that was it i won but whatever um that's not the point the point is is that we get getting to what my mom going back to apologize to the situation and when you know what it doesn't matter what the situation was because um and she of course she didn't explain it to me like this yeah i was really confused and, and angry at her for apologizing saying you need you need to be the you know not the bigger man here but she was just like we can't cause trouble mm. because we are the only asians in this little area and we will they'll they'll like come after us kind of thing. not come after us but like like we'll be shunned we, we, yeah. we won't be like part of the group and uh of course i was confused and pissed off and like going, i can't believe you're like not standing up for me and for many years i felt that way but that's the culture that that i think a lot of asians feel like there's no unity mm. to to feel comfortable to be able to stand up and speak out mm. right so we always get back in line it doesn't matter if it's our fault we have to get back in line or else something bad will happen to us in the end and we we can't defend and stand up for ourselves because no one else is going to help us mm. there's no community around us that can actually like be like okay we're we're like hand in hand we're gonna we're gonna fight you know the racism or whatever it might be because it's like when you're asian it's not like you can fall into the african-american community or the latino community or or the native american community you are your own just like you know the african americans are can't con connect with uh, other communities it's like we have our own community but where is our community to support us yeah where is that support system to support us and if there is a community i feel like it's the korean community and the japanese community it's not the asian community that yeah collectivism right together and even the japanese community there was no japanese community at that time that would be willing to fight and there, it's more like get back in line really and I, I hate to say that i hate to say that about my own community that i felt that way but i did it's the truth yeah, yeah. and uh I, I still can't think of a Japanese American community that just like fights for Japanese Americans. And if they are, are 
those communities out there, they're so on the fringe. Mm. They're not part of the culture. They're on this like this outside fringe that if you even connect with that community, you're you're this radical leftist or you're like something that's not normal. Mm. You're abnormally part of that community. You know, it's not it's not like, well, it's normal to have a community to support Japanese American people's um, issues or or um, you know dealings with you know you know the world mm. and in Newport Beach I, I remember I got the statistic that the Newport Beach the area I was living is 96 percent white so to give you an idea of the landscape of of racial tolerance or understanding or education and awareness it's very yeah it's, it's so minimal that that uh the teachers and the parents and the and everyone else that other white people can look towards to to know what's bad to say that's negative to say um they don't get that they don't get that awareness so they get it's almost like it's reinforced it's okay to be racist in these ways because it's not it's not discussed openly it's not discussed like hey you can't say that yeah. it's not it's not okay to say that amongst your friends because your friends are actually saying no one's saying anything bad about it so i can say this to my friend i can say this to this asian guy i can say this to this african-american guy or girl i can say whatever i want because no one is reinforcing or it's everyone's reinforcing the 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 idea of this ignorance yeah. you know so and they're being um, taught now that they're it's okay which is totally not yeah and it's not even just they're taught that they're like they're just it's not it's not a bad thing to do it's not like it's it's just not it's not a big deal it's not a big deal yeah it's not a big deal say it doesn't matter yeah you know, so un until like it gets on the internet or something, and all of a sudden like the the world's like mocking this kind of thing. This, now it's happening I think, more and more. Yeah. Um, so racism becomes more and more subliminal uh, and hidden. But um, you know, uh, I'm sure like even now in 2017 in Newport Beach, in 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 Dover Shores, in the areas I was in, there is still like you know straightforward outward racism that's like you're like you're confused that people are okay that's okay to say that mm. um in in california you know maybe like you'd say like in small towns and in, in the midwest or small towns here and there um like people say these things all the time but in california a very progressive state newport beach is actually quite conservative and and have this um you know this non-communication about uh you know all the different cultures and communities of people that live yeah. out here that, that make up america yeah what's a step forward that we can take to at least be able to progress this movement i, I think at the end of the day it's it's a it's it's like conversations like this happening because like whoever's going to watch this um that is, is interested in the conversation uh, won't, won't feel alone and you know have that conversation with other people i mean it's constant conversation it's like constant awareness yeah. constant life experience discussing these things and not not hiding and, and bottling it up but like talking about it uh, uh, not as a negative thing this isn't yeah. a negative thing that we're talking about this is just life experience that 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 needs to be shared um and part of growth really you know it's like no one you know whether you're black, white, red, yellow, purple, whatever you are, everyone has different life experiences, and we all need to, ex to talk about it. Yeah. You know, and and uh, and it makes us who we are. You know, and hopefully we learn from it in a positive way, and we do something about it, and we and we um, continue the conversation. So you had this voice that you wanted to express, and when you were talking, what you referred to before, when you were in a band punk and rock, this is really when you were able to express your voice and you were able to find that inner confidence and you were able to be yourself. And this is something that's shown in the documentary, so we don't have to go over too yeah, deep right. but what is, um, and, and then after, after that experience and after that phase, you went through into DJing. And this is something that I haven't heard too much is, why did you decide to choose to be a DJ when, especially back in those days, wasn't as popular as it is now where everybody wants yeah. to listen to electronic music. So how did that shift happen? Talk to us a little bit about the transition. Why you decided to become yeah. this jockey? The, the, there was no intentional shift. It wasn't 
it wasn't like uh, I'm going to be a DJ. Mm. You know, it's it was more um, once again like a tool. Like so, I I finished college. Um, I lived in Santa Barbara for a little bit longer, and then I moved to Los Angeles with my girlfriend at the time. And, uh, and when I did the move to LA, my intention there was to really turn Dimock into a business. Yeah. Uh, uh, I had some releases on my label at the time that had um, enough weight for us to actually, you know, go. Okay, we can really like turn this into a real business, and I, I, I need, but I need to put full time into the business. So I moved to LA with that intention and, uh, and you know, we lived in a small apartment in Hollywood and, um, you know, I, I had to make a name for myself there and make, not, not necessarily for myself, but for the, for the label, the brand. branding really. Yeah. So, um, th- you know, all my friends in LA were either bartenders or like promoting for little nights and, things like that and the next move was is to, is to like join in in on that and start branding Dimoc mm. you know and, and start throwing these parties where I can join in with the, the people that are already doing it and open up the night so how do I open the, up the night I just start DJing mm. so my friend was like hey you want to start DJing at my bar um, he saw my record collection out of a sick record collection of mainly like punk and hardcore music. And he, and he knows he's a punk kid too. He's not really a punk kid. He's a punk adult. And, um, and he's like, yeah, just come in. I'll show you how to do it. It's really easy. You know, it's, like, it wasn't about mixing. It's just about playing music. I'm like, I can play records like this, like a radio show, you know, at, to, at a bar. And that's how I started. It was like, I, I was like, wow, I can, I love the idea of just playing my music. So I'd sit in a chair and I would make, drink some tea, and I was just playing records, just like this. You had no idea what you're doing when you're starting, right? Yeah, but I mean, there's no dance floor or anything. It was just like people sitting in a, in, at a bar, mm-hmm. literally, literally a bar, while I'm playing like hardcore punk music. And I was like, this is dope. I mean, I didn't even pay or anything. Of yeah, course, yeah. I, I wasn't expecting to get paid. I was just like, when can I get the next show? I want to do this every night. This is a lot of fun. And um, and then I met up with this other kid, and um, he was throwing parties at this small bar, and then and I just joined him. And I was the opener. And um, and I would just DJ all, like you know as the opening set. And I would get you know start building out my hip hop collection, and I just loved DJing. Mm. And in the beginning, I was more of a selector. I was just playing records because it was so back early back then. It wasn't digital, so I'd just play like a you know, the Big record into you know Block Party. You know, like an artist that we signed. And then and then what I realized is that we have a lot of these indie acts that are coming through LA and they're they're performing at their own shows. But hey, they can be DJing at our bar mm. at our night. So when Block Party comes through, we can do the after party where they come and DJ. And it's not necessarily about their DJ skills because none of them were DJs. It was more about having a Block Party after party with Kelly from Block Party DJing records of his favorite you know his playlist wow. really and um and then we we grew this really small scene in these small bars the size of this room and uh like 60 hipster kids would come through and then all of a sudden it was a talk of the town and all the lifestyle magazines were talking about it we started throwing different parties with different lifestyle magazines like herb and bpm and um and we became the we became like the the voice of the the indie indie electro Hollywood scene. Mm. So all the bands would come through. They're like, "Oh, we gotta go play at Aoki's party, at uh, the Dimac party." You know, it was like, "Let's go play those parties." And and so after our shows, we can go DJ, have some fun. You know, and give them a hundred bucks and a bar tab. Yeah. You know? yeah. And um, back then, I wasn't really making money. And then I, soon they were like, "Hey, here's like an extra hundred bucks for yourself." Or here's 75 bucks for yourself. I'm like, sweet. Damn. Now I can make some money um, paying off my rent and paying off the Dimock bills. And, and basically, that's how it all started. Yeah, and it took a while for you guys to really, I mean, it was a freaking grind when you guys first started, right? Yeah. And obviously, that was a very smart move on your part to be able to build this community. I'm curious to know, what is another like investment or a risk that you took within the business that when you look back now, you're like, damn, that was a good move. That's what really paved us forward uh you're talking about dimock or in, or just in general dimock um what was a risky move it could be general yeah. as well. i'm trying to think of like a, a risky uh, move for dimock um well 
the big first risk was, you know, because I come from the punk and hardcore community where you don't align yourself with the corporations, you know, you don't align yourself with major labels or anything like that. And I started shedding that concept and idea you know that was more of it seemed like to, to be it just fit the lifestyle of 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 you know the aesthetic of what punk and hardcore is yeah. but it really didn't make any sense in the end because i am essentially trying to get my music out to as many people as possible yeah. um to as many people as possible of the people that care about the music not just like random people that are like oh what's this noise i'll, I'll listen to it more like uh, i'm trying to build the core of what demac is the demographic so um eventually i shed that well i mean at the time it's, it's depending on what the genre of music that we're promoting so at the time it was um you know we were really one of the the most important small labels that were developing all the british indie acts Mm. From Block Party to Claxons to you know even the Gossip who are, who are from Portland, but like started blowing up in in, in the UK, um, you know Mystery Jets, a bunch of indie, like we were signing a lot of British acts and a lot of indie acts in general, and then we went into electro. Finally, like at a later stage, wow. you know, because like we, I was already DJing a lot of the electro, you know, a lot of the the non band. DJs uh, that were that were, that were um, putting out electro music, but I didn't put any of that music out because we were doing so well within our indie world. You know, we were like crushing it for to you know put out all this new music and break these acts in America, and uh, and then I signed Mastercraft, but I signed them. The only way I could sign them, this is our second album, so there's already a lot of heat on them. The only way I could sign them is is if I signed with a major. Mm. So I did a, a big label deal with um the first major and which was really not a major it was like a large indie they're called downtown records okay. and they're based out of new york and they fused infused the capital into the company and then we would sign acts and do 50 50 joint ventures on the acts gotcha. and um yeah i'd say that was the first big big jump as a business from going from being totally independent and then and then signing with with uh you know, a very large entity mm -hmm. that would soon have control of the pocketbooks and the decisions on where, you know, where we're going to go with the business. But I didn't have that kind of money. You know, yeah. I was basically just running off fumes as, as far as, you know, paying for publicists and paying for radio campaigns and paying for whatever I was paying for. I was, uh, I was like, this is very difficult to do it entirely on your own. And we had a very small staff of people. So, and we had a small staff of people that were passionate and loyal, but they didn't have that work experience because mm -hmm. the people with the work experience cost a lot more money for us to handle. So it was more like, you're down with Dimmock, you're down for the sweat and the blood to like really push this culture. And those are the people that I ended up signing or ended up hiring. Really. Yeah. And, um, but they didn't have the work experience. So we had to like, like fail forward together. Proper startup. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hundred percent. Hundred percent startup. I think everybody can relate to this. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a relatable progress, but it's different that like, I mean, we had no, we had no investors. We had no investments. I, it was entirely from my DJ career, and I was making like what hundred bucks a show, or not even a show, a DJ set at a, at a bar. Yeah. So like, you know, the kind of money that, that I was giving the employees was, was nowhere near what you would consider a startup. Um, it was definitely like building the, the community slowly but surely of people that cared. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, it's not, if I go back in time, I would have done it differently, but I don't know if I would have the resources to do it differently. Mm -hmm. Because when you have, when you're at that base and that, that, that small, you're not going to get investors. I didn't know how to build a deck. I didn't know how to build a, uh, you know, a, a package to, to really get investors. I didn't know that world, right? Yeah. So my first step was just like doing what we do well and having people being interested and be like, hey, we want to help you out. But we're going we're gonna to own 50% of the, of the artists that we sign. Right. Like, well, I think that's fair enough. I think it's fair enough. Um, in the end, it was not a great deal. In the end, um, it was like, it felt like the situation of, of being countries in Africa that, are, that get the loan from the World Bank 
and are, are forever in debt. And no matter uh, what happens and the interest rate goes up, they will always be in debt. And that's what it felt like in the end because the debt became so large and I had to pay so much money out that I was forever in debt and I couldn't get out. And I was like, I am gonna, I am like, I, I, can, I can't even claw my way out of this deal. And I'm, and I'm forever in their, um, you know, in the, their decision making. So when, when the, we weren't hitting the bottom line, when they shut the lights off, I can't turn them back on. So the only way I could do it is if I actually close the company up or I'd have to like close the company up and then I'd have to find a way to like pay them back mm-hmm. or like, you know, work out a settlement and I didn't have no money. So personally, I had no money. So what'd you do? Well, we just fought and fought and we figured out like a solution. It took years to find the solution. And, um, I, I don't remember the details, but I got lucky and I got out. I got out of the deal without having to like uh, fork over a lot of money I didn't have. So I got lucky. I got yeah. very, very lucky. So luck was on my side. I don't know if what I, I have to like go back and really like a master understand. negotiator or something. Yeah, it wasn't me as my lawyer, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, even that deal was pretty awful, you know. So um, it was one of those like too good to be true situations and that's one lesson i've learned is that like when it, when a deal is too good to be true it 99 percent is too good to be true actually 100 percent. i i actually am very i'm very skeptical of yeah. any deal that's that's like shining and glimmering and pretty and mm-hmm. and like you know there is there is going to be some issue so it's front-loaded deals like that are are almost entirely bullshit yeah and you have to be yeah you have to like just trust your own gut and know not to take that money and and uh and know not to take that you know you have to like i don't know where i'd be without the downtown deal i mean i wouldn't be able to sign my mastercraft at the time but but i wouldn't be in hell for those those two or three years i was stuck in a steel yeah you know yeah because uh you know if you don't perform entirely the way they expect in the beginning it's not going to look good for you in the end. So, and the, 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 the reality of things performing the way you expect them to perform is actually not always the case. Actually, generally not the case. So I feel like it's a 20% chance that things will perform the way you expect them to perform. Mm-hmm. Your, your idealism is m- much larger and much more real than, you know, I mean, you know, much larger and not, not as real than what's really going to happen yeah. and i think you have to always look at the worst case scenario up you know and but then you know uh, it's like just like anything when you go into a deal and you're selling something you're you're talking about the, the best case scenario yeah so when you're on the the, the other end of the spectrum you got to remember that you know you got to remember that and like almost every uh, investment I've done in the last like six years since I've been growing my entrepreneurial portfolio outside of the music industry. Yeah. Every glimmering, beautiful deal is like never really so shined idea. out. Yeah. So I'm very skeptical. Um, um, you know, you have to wait on it. And if it's one of those things where you have to sign the bottom line right away, don't sign it. Mm-hmm. And that's my general take on it. There's more situations that can come in your way. Um, and the other thing too is like, you know, I always say follow your passion, but remember passion are based on feelings that are not necessarily based on truth or facts. Yeah. It's all emotional. Yeah. And, and so following your emotions into business um, relationships is not necessarily the right way to do it. Yeah. Follow your passion in creativity. But following your passion in in uh, forking over your money is not necessarily the right way to think either. You need pragmatic, like you need to learn how to be pragmatic. You need to, you need to build that side of the brain. Yeah. The the side that you don't really care about, the side that's boring, the side that's like stops you from doing deals or stops you. You need to build that side out, and you need to make that side really sharp. Yeah, or at least have a partner that can at least. Really yeah, or you need to do it on your own, right? Because the partner, necessary. yeah, because the partner itself, like you don't know what their life experiences are. I mean, the thing is, is for me, I, I guess in the end of the day, I need these life experiences of of like seeing the glimmer and seeing that's not true a few times to realize yeah. that like, okay, 
I, I, it's not going to be the case every time. And, you know, my skin just got harder, you know. So I needed that. I needed those fails, mm. but make sure that if you do those, because you're going to have to do those. When you're a young entrepreneur, you're going to be like, deals, deals are going to come your way, yeah. especially if you're publicly known to make money. If you're publicly known to be an influencer, an influencer and making money, deals are going to be thrown at you that look so good. Yeah. And you have, to, you have to just be patient, and you're going to do a couple of those deals. You are going to do a couple of those deals because you're not going to say no to everything. You're like, i got to say yes to some of these things, but realize that they will not – like there might not be fr fruitful deals. Mm -hmm. there'll, there'll be deals that are good for your, your awareness and your wisdom in doing business in the future. That's the best way to put it. And know that you will not make that money back. Mm -hmm. Say it to yourself, not to them. To so setting your own expectations. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Managing your expectations and knowing that whatever deal you put yourself in in the beginning, in the beginning, um, don't put too much. Just put just enough where you can feel it and you can feel the burn so you learn so you're in a different place now where as you mentioned opportunities are just thrown at you every single day people especially want your time and people want to build relationships with you yeah and one of your favorite quotes is do yourself any means necessary but i'm curious to know now when you've got employees you've got a team that's working with you you're traveling all the time it's hard to do everything yourself unless it's the really important aspects of the business yeah. or your career, how do you differentiate what to delegate and what to hand off to someone versus what you should do it yourself at this point in your career? Okay, with, with Dimmock, you know, since we're talking about Dimmock, I did everything myself in the beginning because I had no choice. Yeah. So um, in all aspects of the business, so production and manufacturing to distribution and sales to promotion and publicity and marketing, um, you know, to literally like selling records out of my backpack, to selling records from my the, the, the back of my car, those yeah. kinds of things. To so picking up the records at the vinyl distributors, uh, the, the, I mean the vinyl manufacturers, to delivering them directly to distributors and making the relationships and having the contacts with everyone. Yeah. Um, you know, you, like I did it all, okay? So I already know the process. And then you you do the process over and over again and you, you build the relationships just like with any business. And, uh, and then slowly, you, you know, you're going to have to hand that over when the business grows to that point. So um, for me, like, you know, long story short, with Dimock, I, w I already knew how to run that, that side of the business, train people to do that side of the business. And um, now I'm in a position where Dimock is, sorry, <laughs> now I'm in a position with Dimock is, okay, we've done this for 20 years now. We're at 21 yeah. years of being a business right, by the way. that I don't really need to do the day-to-day -day anymore. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel like effectively that's where I need that's, – that's like the best place for my time. So um, – what is the best? The, place the best, the, the most important thing for this business is hiring the right people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you hear that from every entrepreneur or every CEO. Because once you hire that person, they're with you, and they will, they will, they of course are going to fuck up. They're going to like, you know, do things that aren't that you have to trust their decisions, you know, to do. And and uh, but you have to make sure you hire the right, well-rounded people to be running your company Decent. and allow them to to you know, really own that piece of the company that like it's their business, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, you know, with Lee Carisu, the president of Dimmock, when I found him and it took time, oh my God, it took years and years and years and years to find the right operator. Years, years. I mean, I like other people m managing the business, but to me, I hate to say it, but they're like more placeholders for like, you know, someone that can really understand uh, the bigger business to expand the business and run the operations, do both. You, you need someone that can think outwardly and, and in the future um, as well as, as like making sure the operations are maintained. Um, it's so, so hard to find that person. How did that you guy. know that it was him specifically? Um, well, yeah, of course, I, I didn't know it was him specifically, but he, I knew he, I, I had a relationship with him because he, I actually released my first single on a different label huh. and uh, on Thrive. Thrive released my, my first single, I'm in the House, with, okay. with Super Black in 2008. So I knew he already had like the, the he just he had the breadth of knowledge of running a company. Um, I always want to work with him, but and he had like a, you know, I mean, people pulling on him in different yeah. ways. So um, you got to think of your, your like, okay, here's my pool of people. So you're looking at all the people that 
in your network, right? So I'm looking at a &Rs of major labels. I'm like, no, nah, they're so hands off. I need someone dirty in the nitty gritty, like dealing with things. A lot of a &R people, they're just like, they're good at, at delegating, right? But they're not like hands in. So I need someone that's actually worked at an indie label because it's a completely different model, different dynamic to work at an indie label where you actually have to do everything. Right. They're working at a major label where you have a full infrastructure to deal with. So I decided to like cut away that pool, the major label pool, because we are an indie label. Yeah. And we don't have the bandwidth or the, the, the money to like have an enormous team. We need people that are willing to take on multiple roles and understand all of them. And uh, indie, the indie label pr perspective was definitely the one I, I needed. So luckily, I Lee gave it a chance. We did a honeymoon period. And now he has, you know, he's got a vested interest in the company. He's got equity in the company. And I want him to have that. I want him to feel like it's his company. It is his company as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, technically. So, um, and he, he worked works night and day, blood, sweat, and tears of the company. And I rely on him a lot on the operations and almost entirely. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a part of, I'm, I'm, I'm a head of the A&R team, if you will. It's still my company entirely. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is, Dimock is in my blood. It's, it's my firstborn child. You know, I don't have a kid yet. So it's yes. my firstborn. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm of course the majority um, shareholder, if you want to call it, of the company, sure, sure. Um, and uh, and I have a pretty solid team. It just took a long, long time, long time to build that. And so beyond Dimac now, you are not just fighting for opportunities for Dimac, but your own time. This is really where, when you stepped out of Dimac, your time is really the most valuable, and especially who you hang out with. Right? Yeah. The people, the five people, the ten people that you really are in your inner circle can really drain you, it can make you, it can break you. And at this point in your life where you're so globally recognized and people are trying to fight for your time and your attention and your relationship, what are the criteria that you use to filter out the people that you may not know so that they can, you know, that you can give your time, your valuable time yeah. to, to those people? Okay, so before we get to that, you know, I feel like we just barely scratched the surface as far as um, business, the Aoki business model. Mm. And I, I mean, I, I don't want to get too digress too much into that, but no, like what, once Dimock was established and I was able to leave it, then yes, the bandwidth of time that I had to to give to Aoki business, Aoki business, how are we going to say it? <laughs> In America, to the, to, the, to the white man is Aoki, you know? Yeah, Aoki. Uh, yeah, I, I, like, I, I'm like, this is my world, so I always say Aoki. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of, of saying it. But, um, uh, yeah, my 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 bandwidth opened up, and I, you know, like and, and like I said, like when I first started getting into to the idea of being an entrepreneur, you know, if you will, then um, yeah, I, I was doing a bunch of different deals in a bunch of different fields, and and then it was more like testing the waters of how much time I could put into into what and what is going to, you know, uh, give me back. Uh, the most, mm. you know, whether well, it's not necessarily about money, it's more about like, you know, because when you give something time, you want to get, uh, you want to get this ap appreciation back, whether it's not just money, but it's uh, this factor of like, you feel good at the end of the day. It's like, oh, it makes you feel good, yeah. right? Like I feel good about this, regardless of getting money back, whether it's starting a charitable organization where of course it's not about getting money back. It's more about like, you know, sharing awareness on the, the issues at hand that we're that we're raising money towards or the organizations and research institutes that are doing outstanding work as far as you know you know brain research or the things that we we, we really focused on mm -hmm. in the last few years um so it's about that you know and like and figuring out like you know my pie my my pie chart of my time and how much i can give to what and in order to maintain that we're going to get to your question of who I really spend my time with. And uh, I, I think we all get there as we get older that you spend less time with your friends that you grew up with and friends you went to college with, friends you met at bars or clubs or whatever it might be, and you're spending more time with the people you work with. You know, like I spend almost entirely most of my time with people I work with and like, let's say my partner, you know. So like that's, that's really where I spend the majority of my time with. And then when I see people that, that are from my past that I, that I really cherish my time with them, 
the friends that I made, whether it's other artists or whether like friends from the past, I see them, you know, like through my life, you know, but they're not like, uh, you know, the people I consistently talk to and confide with and business has just become such a large part of my life it is it is my life you know I, it's the studio brand yes it's like everything i do what sleep wake up whatever i do it's i'm constantly thinking about that it's not business it's like business is life you know in in the way that uh it's no longer like i i'm i'm, I'm like this is my work hour and then when i'm done with work i'm like free here no no business is 24 hours you know for me and i want that way. always on I'm always on. Actually, I don't know if that's a good thing. Actually, it's probably not. But it's just it what motivates me. It's what inspires me. And business is not necessarily just about uh, number crunching or how much money I'm making or, or, or this, that, and the other. It's more like the, the, the process of creation, the process of uh, collaboration, the process of, and at the end of the day, connection and sharing whatever it is, whether it's product, whether it's fashion, whether it's uh, music, um, and at, and and at the end of the day, it's like whether it's product, fashion, music, uh, lifestyle, culture, all those things. At the very end, is we, what we what we've been talking to at the very 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 beginning is the concept of sharing and connectivity with those things. And I want to make sure that whatever I'm part of has something that leaves someone happy. That leaves someone with a meaningful experience, whether it's a live show, whether it's a song, uh, whether it's a T-shirt, whether it's socks, you know, happy socks. These happy yeah, socks, yeah, you, know? yeah. you know. And um, and I want it to feel like I want people to to appreciate it and have that experience. It's like a an Aoki experience, mm. the cake in the face, an Aoki experience, the um, you know, the song. The Pursuit, Pursuit of Happiness remix that everyone knows about Aoki feeling when you hear that song to, you know, a new album, the Colony. It's an Aoki experience, you know. Um, and, you know, it's like so many ways to find that experience. So that's one of your metrics. It's like the feeling and the emotion that you deliver to someone as like the end product. That's 100 percent. That's the entire metrics. Love it. And you mentioned that work is so much a big part of your life now. It's basically 24 seven, as you mentioned. Do you ever get lonely? Um, it's a. Uh, Sorry, can I get just a question? What time on the Saturday? It's a good question. We had uh, Robert Green on on the podcast. I know you read Mastery. Oh yeah, yeah, no. That he he got a really interesting answer about that as well. What he said? Um, I can't remember. Uh, I think he talked about you just gotta embrace it. Because he, he's a writer. Yeah. Um, but Sounds a little... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point in your career now, as you mentioned, you are on 24-7. And business is a big part of your life. And you also mentioned that personal friends or, or the acquaintances that you had, you may not get to see so often. So how do you deal with loneliness? Uh, loneliness is, yeah, I guess that you, you have... Is it a little uh, sensor? Yeah. 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 Okay, so, Rolling. Uh, just start from his answer if you like. I got your question. Cool. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So, sure. oh, you want to ask, ask again? Sure. Just okay. so that it flows yeah. better. Yeah. So at this point in your career now, you are on twenty four seven, and business is really your life. And you mentioned that personal friends and acquaintances is something that may not be a regular routine for you. So, how do you deal with loneliness? Okay. So loneliness is just part of life, right? So we're all gonna feel lonely. Um, I think the best way. For me to explain it is is a is a reference or analogy to something that everyone or I mean not everyone but most people have gone through is just heartache or like heartbreak, right? When you when you break up with someone um, and you, that you love so much and then you break up with them, 
how do you deal with the heartbreak? The one thing you can't do, and the one thing that that you should never do is is stop living. Yeah. Right. In any extent of what that means, you should not. You should do the opposite of that. Right. Um, and there's different ways to cope through that. There's different ways to deal with that. Right. So whether you go to therapy, um, whether you like for me. Um, that's something I'm constantly learning as well. Like, how do I deal with things that 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 like that really pull that really like pull at my heart that that um, that affect me, you know, deeply, like loneliness or heartbreak or whatever it might be. Um, how I've dealt with it, which is not the right way, is distraction mm. by staying busy. It's not the therapeutically right way to deal with it because it will come back and haunt you later and it'll hit you when you least expect it in a bigger way which i've learned through therapy and that's another thing too is to be able to talk about these situations talk not just to your friends but talk to someone that's actually been through this a million times and talk to other people that have been been through this uh, you know a bunch of times yeah. and that's why it's i think it's really important to talk to a therapist through those very human conditions that we all will deal with because there's plenty of people that are lonely that are in relationships as well. There's plenty of people lonely that, that don't true. have business. That's true. And, and they don't know how to deal with it or they don't even know what's wrong with them. But you have to talk it out. And you have to like, most importantly also in this, in this regard, know that we're not alone. Mm. You know, like this is not something that, that only you singularly deal with. But millions of people deal with and the last thing that you have to do, the last thing you should do, like I said, is to stop living. And it's probably the easiest thing sometimes that you can think of. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's just yeah. like you have to cope with it, embrace it, deal with it effectively. And for me, the word effective is very, very important with yeah. my time. Yeah. yeah you know, kidding. so um, I, I, I talk to a therapist and I go through my, my own issues. And given time, you, you mentioned that, I mean, obviously, with so many shows that you're doing, there's just not enough time for you to allocate on everything that you want. How do you make time to grow? How do you make time to learn and to constantly develop yourself? Yeah, that's a, that's that's a that's a that's definitely a balancing act. That's very difficult. It's like I'm on a tightrope yeah. on a windy day above two buildings, but I'm experienced tightrope walker. Okay, yeah. so I'm, that's how I feel about like you know just trying to stay on the rope and get and feed my brain. I am all about the brain, you know, and I want and I want to get I want to get as much as I can in the brain as possible, mm. um, and I and I obsess over it, but at the end of the day, it's action is the only way to get to feed your brain. You have to really go out and read and 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 put muscle memory to work, yeah. and uh, and and you have to find the time. So I plan things far out ahead, just like I've planned this hour with you. I have hours planned for whether it's piano lessons or whether it's meditation or whether it's like um, things that are important to my life that are that are important for my my growth and my own business and my own creativity mm -hmm. and also outside of that too. And um, I used to read a book a month and now I've, I stopped that. So so one thing I also learned too is is um, habits are everything and routine is everything. So you have to the the difficult part is is picking up a habit. Yeah. Not necessarily like when I say habits, when you say habit, you generally, it means a bad thing, but good, there's good habits. So you can, you just have to do it on a daily basis. And uh, one thing I've been really, really uh, not hard on myself, but like really um, um, consistent is this, this uh, idea, this concept called Aoki Bootcamp, mm -hmm. where we, we, I, I have my own team that we're, I'm on the road with and I see them the most. So we have uh, a routine that we do where we have to work out every day. Um, we have a, a certain amount of workouts that we do every day. And if we don't do it, by the end of 12 o'clock at midnight, we have to pay a penalty that goes to, this, to my foundation. Even if you're injured? Yeah, you know, even if I'm injured, I've, I do other workouts, you know, yeah. or if I have to get a doctor's note or something like this. <laughs> yeah. But it's to that point, you know, and it's like a real bet. It's a real, it's a real penalty, and then everyone's paid. Mm. You know, everyone's paid money towards the charity. So it's like once you once that money gets burned from your pocket, you you really do actually do the workouts and you really stay on the habit on the on building the routine, which creates a habit. So it's just like I need to eat. I also need to do a workout. 
So I'll, well, I might even do push-ups right here. Mm. Or I might even do something, you know, anywhere. Yeah. Uh, right, right at yeah. dinner, I might just like just jack in some push-ups right on the floor, which yeah. I, I've done before. Because I'm like, it's almost 12. We got we to gotta <laughs> knock out this workout, you know. It's yeah. get my daily routine fixing, you know. Something that I can consistently do every single day. Mm. So if I use that same model and apply it to something else, then that's what I need to do to maintain the habits and routines of things to educate myself, yeah. like learning a different language or you know, whatever it might be. So I know one of your favorite books is A Brief History of Nearly Everything. Yeah. And it's interesting because you are now a, well, you have this passion for future technology and you're a futurist, especially with hanging out with guys like Ray Kurzweil and Rita Grave. Where did that passion start and what got you really into it? All right, so the book that Bill Bryson wrote, um, the way it's written is very scientific. Mm. And uh, when you think about the future, it's like, I, I think about it in that same regard. So um, the book itself is like a precursor of what's to come. You know, like when you, it's like a, uh, you hear what, what's, how, how the world, the Big Bang Theory to, you know, the different epochs of time to, you know, here we are and then the trajectory of where we're going. And um, Ray Kurzweil, when you, when you speak about Ray Kurzweil, he, he also, the way he writes is like, okay, this is where we've, we've um, gone through technology and this is where my trajectory thinks uh, of, of like the calculations of how things are going and where, where we're going. And it's, and it's in a lit, not in a linear, um, uh, it's yeah, right. It's an exponential curve of where the technology is moving, mm -hmm. which, which will lead us to what is known as this, this or what is coined as a singularity, um, where, the expansion of knowledge and technology and and where we are we, we just don't we, we can't understand it at this yeah. point you know yeah. um but all these ideas of of you know us turning into you know ai robots you know um you know like like all the science fiction concepts are becoming science fact mm. so, so crazy. And when you when you boil that down that's stuff that i was interested in when i was a kid reading comic books mm -hmm. and sci-fi. I'm a sci-fi geek for sure. Yeah, yeah. So for any sci-fi geek, we can now see that it, a lot of that, those concepts are going to be real, possibly in our lifetime. And um, when you do, when you read into the science journals and you actually get through all their technical language and you understand what, what they're working on, and what DARPA was doing and what, you know, all these different things are happening. It's, um, it's very real stuff. It's, re it's not like conspiracy theories. It's yeah. not, it's like real stuff that's happening now. So, um, I, I just want to be on the cusp of it. I want to, I want to talk to the people that are doing the research. Mm. Uh, I want to be the first to know about this information. So that's why, like I, uh, that's why I've na named my album Neon Future and and recruited Aubrey de Grey, who's doing research on how to end aging, how to like stop cells from from dying, or overpopulating or mutating. And uh, I wanted to interview Raker as well and talk to him and put him on the album. Yeah. I want to talk to these people that are that are uh, you know the the the. the um, the people that are, are conducting the research and, and, and uh, you know, on the forefront of technology. And now since I'm, you know, a little bit more wiser, just a little bit more wiser in, in the entrepreneurship world, I, I know that I'll be expanding in that world. That's mm -hmm. definitely a future for me that I'm going to learn because I, I want to learn by living. That's like the best way for me to learn is by living it and by being in that experience and being around people that are, wise in, in, the, in those worlds and feeding off that, you know, their knowledge and energy. And um, I know that's, that's definitely like innately something that I'm always striving to, you know, I'm always want to be around that. I want to be around the, like the, 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 the best of the best and learn it's from them. Yeah. And as I get, you know, more influential in my world, those doors open up. Those doors open up that I that would have never opened up for me before. I would have never got, you know, into a room with Richard Dawkins and in, in Oxford University and had an interview with him. That actually never surfaced. That, yeah. yeah, like we I did a full interview with him, flew all the way to Oxford University in, in England and I interviewed Richard Dawkins after I read The God Delusion. So it's like uh, um, you know, it's like 
would he have met with me before that time period of time? I don't think so. So, you know, I, I, I got to take, um, take into account, you know, hopefully that those doors open up and I, and I take up those opportunities and I, and I really embrace those opportunities because they might not happen later on. Right. So I have to just, you know, like, like, it's just like getting into a school, getting into like a, a school you want to get into. You know, you got to send out the applications. Yeah. You got to do the work and put the applications out. I love that. Yeah. So final question is, we leave the audience with one small actionable challenge that they can do after listening to the podcast and go out there to do. It could be anything that can help them impact more people, it could be to grow and to, to be able to reach their full potential. What is that one small actionable step that they can do after listening to some of the advice that you share and kind of the central fo focus of the topics that we talked about? I guess what one, one thing I think that, that um, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, it's, you know, I always say follow your passion, follow your passion 100% because that's how we're going to, that's where you're going to get the most output of your time. You have to really care about what you're doing. And if you don't, you need to like switch things up and, and move on somewhere else. That's for one. That's the, that's like the one part. And the second part to that is, is build your pragmatic brain and, and uh, don't rely on anyone else to build that brain, but you have to build it yourself, whether it's through life experience. And if it's life experience, then you need to hedge your bets accordingly to the proportion of how much you have and not put all your eggs in that basket. So you got to like build both sides of this brain and, and, uh, and survive. Another thing too is survive because you will fail. That, that is, that is a, a testament to life is, is failure. And we will fail no matter what we will fail. And, you know, be able, the most important thing is being able to, to get back up on that horse. Yeah. And maybe getting back on that horse is not really what you should be doing. Maybe you should be getting on a different horse. So always know that you will fail, but you got to be sure to, you know, that you will survive the storm after, you know, be prepared for that. Not over prepared. You know, it's like, I guess it is a balancing act. Yeah. But, yeah. Great. Powerful yeah. Interview. Thanks Thank so you. much, man. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Right. Halfway push-ups. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, you can do this on the couch. No, it's just on the ground, man. Get your hands dirty a little bit. All right, ready? So face this way. Face this way. This way. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're gonna do fifty push-ups, halfway, and whatever gets. Yeah. First. Okay. okay, you ready? So let's go. Down. Three, two, one. <laughs> What? <laughs> oh. Halfway is so much easier. Oh man. Let's do you want another 50? Oh man. Let's do one more. Let's do one more oh, round. 50. Well, it's good for you, man. 30. We did 30. No, no, 50. Mike! 50, let's go. <laughs> Mike, bro. Too late, bro. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got lucky. Doug, Doug, 50. Doug, 50. I can't do 50. You can? Halfway, halfway. Halfway, bro. 50, you have to do 50. Halfway, though. Halfway. It's not that bad. Oh, now it's going to be bad. You're going to do this. I'll do as many as I can. Let's do 50. Yeah, don't say I can't do 50. That's bullshit, man. Wait, where's your by any means necessary tattoo? I don't have one yet. Oh, okay, that's why I can't do 50. <laughs> Ready? Okay, you're doing 50. Everyone's doing 50. All right. Let's go. Three, two, one. Done. <laughs> Dog, those are horrible push-ups. Horrible. You go like go like 30 degrees, bro.
50. Yeah, I did 50 of that. I'm just kidding, bro. It's good. Good for you. Good job, man. Let's get another 50. No, no. Should we do one more round? Let's do one more round, man. Brian, 50. Brian, 50. Let's go. Sweat, bro. Now though? Push-ups, come here. No, come here. 17 was the most. Aoki boot camp, let's go. Hold on, let's see who else we can do. Oh, there's more. Let's go with the Like a row? Oh, the 90 proper ones, and then those last. I can't really breathe, man. I'm doing it here. I just want to show the ability for this. And also, these are halfway push ups. Now, you're halfway push ups. Nine degrees. Nine degrees. Nine degrees. You want to do it? You made it to 500? We're all doing it? Oh, yeah? There it is. Yes. Hey, it's like it's like you know, just morale. You know what I'm saying? Eliza, Eliza's in. Get down. Eliza's in. Aoki, boot camp. Yes. Friendly. It's not about being friendly. It's about fucking getting work done. Hey, here we go. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey,